So this morning, we're moving into finishing up John chapter 4. I don't think I get to John chapter 5 today, but I want to ask you a question. Are you ready? Do you ever struggle to untangle a scripture? Do you ever find one of those scriptures and you just think, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't get this. This, this doesn't make sense to me. This, there's, there's something amiss here. Now, some of those are really massive scriptures, like those whom he predestined, he also foreknew. And, and you know, some of them you look at it and say, wow. Or, or the Hebrews passage about falling away. But I thought once you were saved, you don't fall away. And you know, there are those types of passages. But let me give you one that may have never made your list before because it just looks incidental. But like so many passages that are incidental, I think it tells an incredibly important story that we need to get. You ready for the passage? Here it is. After the two days, whoops, go back to PowerPoint. They thought I was going to the Bible. <laughs> we could do it that way. I just put it in the PowerPoint. After the two days, Jesus departed for Galilee. Jesus has been in Samaria. After the two days, he departed for Galilee. For Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast. For they too had gone to the feast. Now you may be saying, that doesn't look too troublesome to me. Looks like he spent two days in Samaria and he went to Galilee. We've heard that passage where Jesus said a prophet has no honor in his hometown. And then the Galileans welcome him because they'd seen what he'd done in Jerusalem. They'd gone to the feast. Where's the thorniness? All right. I'm going to help you. Here's the thorniness. It starts out with this Greek word gar. Not the fish, but it's spelled the same way. It's gamma, alpha, rho, G-A-R, gar. It's translated for. Jesus himself had testified a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. Now, Galilee is where Jesus is from. So, start looking at that for a minute. After two days, he departs for Galilee because Jesus has testified he doesn't have honor in his own hometown. His patris, his, his uh, fatherland. And then, look at that next word, so. When he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. That word so, un, it, it, it just three little letters, o Upsilon nu, uh, O U N. Un means because, uh, therefore. So. Now, Jesus goes to Galilee. He's testified that a prophet doesn't have honor there. And then when he comes, they welcomed him. It just. He put different words in there to translate for and so. After two days, he departed for Galilee because Jesus himself had testified a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. Therefore, when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. It doesn't make sense. Someone said that. Who said that? Yes, Carol, it doesn't make sense. Now you're with me. Anybody else saying, it really doesn't make sense. If it makes sense to you, then you're not looking at it close enough. Because it doesn't make sense. That's like saying, okay, I've stayed here long enough. Now I'm going to go over there because over there people aren't nice to me. So I'm going to go over here and, and here I am because everybody's nice to me. And you just sit there. And so it, it's interesting, um, D.A. Carson decades ago, wrote a paper, published a paper on this, where he went through 10 different ideas of what this might mean. And it's fascinating to see all these different ideas. Some people say, well, John is saying that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. 
maybe John's done a shift and says that Jerusalem is really the hometown of Jesus because that's ultimately the, the, the king's city and Jesus is the king of kings. So it's talking about no honor in Jerusalem, so he's gone to Galilee. Well, no, Jerusalem's never called the hometown of Jesus, and John over and over references Galilee as Jesus' homeland. So, I mean, it, nice try, but no cigar. Um, and then people say, well, uh, look at this. I mean, this is, this is a sign that Jesus is really interested in getting glorified and honored. And they just turned around and decided to do it this time in Galilee. No, Jesus was never seeking glory out on earth. He had put aside his glory and was seeking to serve on earth. So that's not it either. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to untangle this scripture with you. And to do that is a three-step process. You ready? Here it is on the chalkboard. First, we're going to review the passage for context, then examine it carefully, and then we'll draw fair conclusions. Okay? Review for context, examine it carefully, draw fair conclusions. Let's start with a review for context. Remember, we're in John chapter 4. Now, if you go back to the end of John 2 and into John 3, Jesus is in Jerusalem. That's where he encountered Nicodemus, the Orthodox Jew. And that's the famous passage about Jesus saying to Nicodemus, unless someone is born from above or born again or born anew, they don't enter the kingdom. And they had that, that dialogue back and forth. But before that encounter with Nicodemus, John gave us this passage. He said, now when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast at Pesach, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about people. He knew what was in people. He made people. So Jesus did these signs. Many believed when they saw the signs, but Jesus didn't entrust himself to them because he knew that, that they were fickle. He knew that that belief was not deeply rooted. He knew what was in their heart and that they would turn on him at some appropriate time. So that happens in Jerusalem. Now, this is context. We want the flow for what John's writing. So if we put it on a map, that's down in Jerusalem. Jesus has got to get up to Galilee. That's where he's headed. To do that, one route, the direct route, goes up through Samaria. Not the preferred route of an Orthodox Jew, but it would get him up there to the Sea of Galilee, which is what um, Hal was talking about. It's that top lake up there. Lake Knesseret. So he's on his way there. Jesus could have gone the long way around. It's an extra 25 miles, but he could have avoided seeing those nasty Samaritans. But he doesn't go that extra 25 miles. He just goes right through Samaria, compelled by God to do it because he's on God's mission. He says, I had to. Or John says he had to. He was compelled by a mission of God to go. So he goes up through there. Now remember, Jews and Samaritans detested each other by and large. Not just, oh, I don't like you. Well, I don't like you either. I'm talking absolute detest. <clears throat> Jesus encounters a woman who has three strikes against her compared to Nicodemus. He's finished with Nicodemus, the Orthodox Jew, and now he finds her. Strike number one, she's a Samaritan. Hate the Samaritans. Strike number two, she's a woman. A lot of women are. Big problem. Strike number three, she was a sexual sinner. Three strikes, you're out. Now, I gave you that slide if you were here last Sunday, and I gave you this slide as well to watch the growth of faith 
by Jesus engaging with her in Revelation. I repeat this because one third of you were not here last week if statistics bear themselves out. The two thirds that were here probably forgot this slide anyway. So it bears repeating. All right? So here is the slide. I love this guy. Ephraim the Syriac, 300s AD. First, the Samaritan woman caught sight of a thirsty man, then a Jew, then a rabbi, afterwards a prophet, last of all the Messiah. She tried to get the better of the thirsty man. She showed her dislike of the Jew. She heckled the rabbi, but was swept off her feet by the prophet and adored the Messiah. Said it much better than I could. But that's the experience that Jesus has just had in Samaria after the Jerusalem experience. Now, I told you last week the contrast between Nicodemus and the woman at the well could not be greater. But I'll go a step further this week and say the contrast between Jerusalem and Samaria could not be greater. You say, well, of course, they, you know, Jerusalem was the seat of, of Jewish government. It was the seat of Jewish uh, uh, temple religion. It was the seat of, no, 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 no. I'm talking about the contrast between the way they received Jesus. Look at it this way. Jerusalem. Many believed in his name, reputation. Greek word for, for name, think reputation, think curriculum, vitae, resume. Uh, that, that's what's inherent in, in um, the name, onoma, the name of Jesus. Name just meant not your label, it meant your character, who you were, what you'd done. Many believed in his name. They thought, hey, this guy really is something else. When they saw the signs that he was doing. Jesus didn't entrust himself to them just because they thought he was a miracle worker or a wonder worker or, hey, this guy can do some pretty good stuff. Doesn't mean they believed his message. They believed what he was doing. They believed he was spectacular. They believed it was like a show worth going to see. Samaria, they believed Jesus was Messiah. Not because he was doing miracles and it was the entertainment hour. They believed because of his word. Samaria, the Samaritans are the ones who said, we believe. We know this is indeed the savior of the world. See, the reception Jesus got in Jerusalem was just, hey, wonder worker, dude. Great. Cool. Hey, come watch the, the, the magic show. This guy's really good. He can do some pretty cool things. The Samaritans, on the other hand, did at first engage because Jesus had insight into this woman's history. But that's not what ultimately caught them. John makes it real clear. They said at first, we, we believe because what she said and that you knew what she was thinking and all, but now we've heard you. Now we hear you. Now we believe that you are the Messiah because of what you've said, because of your words. We know you're the Savior of the world, not just Israel, not just Judea, not just Galilee, not just Jews, not just the diaspora, the dispersed Jews around the Mediterranean and others. You're the Savior of the world, the cosmos of everything. Unlike Jerusalem, where Jesus left because he knew better to entrust himself to them, in Samaria, he stays two days. He eats with them. He sleeps with them. He stays with them. He teaches them. He fellowships with them. He communes with them. The untouchables, the detestables, the ones no one who's a decent Jew want to have anything to do with. And Jesus is there. Now into that flow, we need to understand the story. 
the text of John 4, 43 through 54. So let's look at the story now, and then we'll come back and, and look at that passage again. That's the troublesome passage. So, Jesus, after two days, he departed for Galilee. This is our troublesome passage. After two days, he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself testified a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. Excuse me. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all he'd done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had, whoops, gone to the feast. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he'd made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, doesn't, doesn't hear he came through Samaria. Here he came from Judea to Galilee. He went to Jesus and asked him to come down and heal his son. Come down, because Capernaum is seaside, Sea of Galilee, lakeside. But it's, it's a couple hundred feet below sea level. You go down to it, wherever you're coming from. It's like you always go up to Jerusalem. You always go down in Scripture to, to the Sea of Galilee. So he came down to heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. He stays on point. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked the hour when he began to get better. And they said, yesterday at the seventh hour. It's about 1 p.m. The fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. You got it? All right. Now, look at this story for a moment. I'm going to pull out. Um, well, let's do it this way. Let's keep on here for a moment. There's something really unusual here, and, and the ESV helps us. The English Standard Version helps us. Jesus came again to Cana in Galilee, where he made the water wine. Capernaum, there's an official whose son's ill. Jesus says to him, the official wants him to heal his son. Jesus says, unless you see signs. You see that footnote too? Right there? Look down at the bottom. Two. The Greek for you is plural. Twice in this verse. See, this is where you can tell the translators are not from Lubbock, Texas. The Lubbock translation of this, which I know because I've translated it into Lubbock before, the Lubbock translation picks up on this. In the Lubbock translation, the man comes to Jesus, Jesus says to the man, and then look, unless y'all see signs and wonders, y'all will not believe. That's what it says. It's just the Brits and other Yankees behind this version of the Bible <laughs> do not translate y'all when they get it. But oida there, the verb for see, is second person plural. Y'all see. Pestuo, the verb believe, is second person plural. Y'all believe. Here's what happens. Jesus is telling the crowd, not the fellow who came up for help with his son. 
fella comes up and says, my son's sick. He's about to die. I need your help. Jesus looks at all those Galileans and says, unless y'all see signs and wonders, y'all won't believe. They had the same problem in Galilee that the, 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 the folks had had in Jerusalem. They need the miracle work and razzmatazz magic show. And if all Jesus is is a miracle working razzmatazz magic show, he's not much better than somebody you can see in Vegas. But Jesus is something different. Jesus is not Jesus is not a trickster. And a magician, he's not just a, a guy who's able to work some miracles. He's not just a doctor without a boundary or border or whatever they're called. Jesus is God and he is the anointed Messiah, the awaited Messiah of Israel who's also the Savior of the world. Israel awaits a Messiah. They await an anointed one who's going to be like unto Moses from among the people. From the, the, the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to sit on the throne of David. They await an anointed prophet, priest, and king. That's the Messiah. But Jesus is also the Savior of the world because the world needs saving. Everybody in this world's in need of a Savior. And that's what this is. Now, Jesus goes down and heals them. If we go back to the PowerPoint, Jesus still does the work of the Messiah. Jesus doesn't refrain from doing the work of the Messiah. Look at Isaiah 35, 4 through 6. It's a passage where Isaiah the prophet prophesies about the coming Messiah it says come God will come and save you the word save is the root of Jesus's name if you're reading it you can almost read Jesus in it in the Hebrew Yeshua is rooted in God Yahweh being the Savior so God will come and he will Jesus you. Jesus is just the Greek word. Then he will Yeshua you. Let's use Jesus' Hebrew name. God will come and Yeshua you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened. The ears of the deaf unstopped. The lame man will leap like a deer. The tongue of the mute will sing for joy. That's what the Messiah is going to come do. Jesus did the work of the Messiah, Isaiah 35. Surely he has borne our griefs. He has carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God. We esteemed him afflicted. And he was. But Jesus was pierced. For our transgressions, not for his. He was crushed for our iniquities, not for his. This is the reason for the communion service this morning. He did all of that so we could partake of his life. Something had to be done to take care of our sin. And all of its consequences. He was crushed for our iniquities. Oh, Jesus, look at him. He was chastised. Paul does it this way. Paul grabs out of the Torah the phrase, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And Paul says, for years that had been a stumbling block, Paul could not understand that Jesus could possibly be Messiah. Paul thought, hey, I got this. I can tell you one reason alone, Jesus can't be Messiah. I got one reason. I got a text in the Bible. You can't run from it. It's there. Says it in the Torah. Cursed is every man who hangs on a tree. How can Jesus be the Messiah if he's cursed? 
And it wasn't until the scales fell from his eyes that Paul understood Jesus was cursed for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement that belonged to us was put on him so that we could have peace. By his wounds we are healed. So Jesus goes about still doing the work of the Messiah even though he's in the midst of a bunch of Galileans who honor him only to the extent he was a free freak show. Someone who could heal people. Probably had like some, some, something weird going on. Some of them would even think he was demonically possessed because he did it. So this is the way that was. Now, by the way, John doesn't want you to miss this. John wants to tie all of this narrative together. He wants you to see all of this flow. Remember, we added chapters and verses. John did not. But John is still flowing this from all the way back in earlier in chapter 2. He doesn't want us to forget. So chapter 2 started with the wedding in Cana. Jesus coming into his ministry. And from the wedding in Cana, Jesus goes to Jerusalem. We've got the Jerusalem experience, Samaria, and now we're back in Galilee. You follow that? But John wants you to make that complete circle and understand all of this together. So John is using parallel statements here. He'll talk about the wedding at Cana and use some of the same language here that he used in chapter 2 so that you're seeing this whole picture. So in John 2, 1, he goes to Cana to a wedding. In John 4, 46, he comes again to Cana. In John 2, 1 through 11, he's at the wedding and he changes the water into wine. John reminds you of that just two chapters later. This is Cana where he made the water wine. In John 2, 11 and 12, from there Jesus uh, uh, does a Capernaum and, 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 and the miracle is mentioned as the first sign that John's going to write about. He does the first sign. Here, again, Capernaum is mentioned and this is the second sign. So you got all of these parallels because John wants you to see all of this put together. He's tied it in a nice bow. And what he's done is he's told you to compare the faith between those people who consider Jesus something amazing to watch and those people who understood him to be the Savior of the world. So that's the dichotomy here. The dichotomy is many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing, but Jesus didn't trust himself to them because they didn't trust Jesus. He knew they were just there for the show. Maybe the fascination, maybe the interest, but not the devoted faith. And what was true in Jerusalem was also true in Galilee. The Galileans welcomed him. Having seen all he'd done in Jerusalem at the feast, they were part of those people in Jerusalem. And Jesus said to them, unless y'all... See, signs and wonders, y'all won't believe. Got it? That's the story. Now, let's untangle this passage. After the two days, so Jesus is in Samaria for two days, where they believe on his word, they understand he's Messiah. They understand he's Savior of the world. They put their faith in him. They trust him. He stays and ministers and loves on them and teaches them and fellowships with them and communes with them for two solid days. And then he departs for Galilee. Now because... Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown makes some sense. He goes to Galilee knowing full well what's going on. He goes to Galilee knowing he's not honored as the Savior of the world. He's viewed as a spectacle worthy of entertainment value. 
and maybe help if you're just desperate enough. So therefore, when he comes to Galilee, the Galileans believe him or welcome him, but they're not truly giving him honor. He doesn't get honor there. Honor is not welcoming Jesus because of all of these incredible things he's done. Honoring Jesus is not welcoming him as a sideshow, something worthy of... Look, there are people that I know who I care about who believed that Jesus was a really good man, who had some really incredible teaching. And if that's it, that's not honoring Jesus. That's dishonoring God. To say God is, he's a good man. Tell that God, he was a good man. He was a good teacher. God was a very good teacher. Like a lot of other humans. No. No, God is far beyond that. Jesus is not just a good teacher, not just a really good guy. That's not what our faith is to be. So I ask you this question, because I think it's a question John wants you to ask when you read this passage. Why do you believe? Why, why, why do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? It's a complicated answer for me. I can't leave out the miraculous. I can't leave out His love for me. I can't leave out His compassion for me. But I'm not supposed to leave those out. That's inherent in who God is. I'm supposed to see that. He loved that woman at the well in Samaria. He took an interest in her. He looked past her sexual sin to bring her healing and peace. And through her reached a community of outcasts that had been at the throats of the Jews for generations. There's certainly room to believe because of the love and the compassion of Jesus. But it goes deeper than that. I'd love to tell you I believe, but not because I need Jesus. Oh no, I need Jesus. I was exchanging emails with a um, uh, Believer uh, in, in the mid-20s, I would say about 23, 24-year-old believer uh, this last week. Um, and, and in this emails, the question was asked, you know, I've, the, 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 the person said, this is a person who went to a Christian school, went to a Christian university, is really smart, has done extremely well, full bright scholar, um, just really a sharp person, but asked me the question, said, I've met a lot of people who are really good people, but they're not Christians. What makes a Christian different? And, and it goes to the root of this. What makes a Christian different is a relationship with Jesus that's not based on him being anything less than the Son of God. But when you see Jesus as the Son of God and your relationship is based on that, with all that it entails, then it's a whole different ball game. And that's the relationship that is trustworthy to God. Doesn't make you perfect. Doesn't mean you don't mess up. Doesn't mean you, you aren't sinning right and left as you're trying to figure out how to be holy before God. But it means he's at work in you to help change you into who you need to be. He is sanctifying you. He is making you holy. He's doing that for me. And so why do we believe? Because it's the truth. Because he's the son of God. Because God so loved the world that 
he came down to get rid of our sin. I don't believe because I like to come here on Sunday mornings and hug my friends. We do that somewhere else. I believe because there's a God who made me into being in a relationship with him. And through the sin in which I live, the sin which I've inherited in my nature, I am not what I need to be to fellowship with him. I'm like this pen. You're this pen. This is Adam and Eve. They're made to be in fellowship with God. But sin separates from God. And they're down there on the ground. And God's up here. And those pins can do all the work they want to do and just be the best pins possible. But they're not getting back up here. That's the biblical image. God has to come down there and collect the pins. But to be up here, they've got to be pure. Because God's not going to be polluted. He can't change. So the pins have got to get up here. And if the pins are going to get up here, how are they going to do it? God's going to reach down and take them in Jesus. And in Jesus. I mean, why do I believe? It's the truth. It's how I can relate to a holy God. There's no other way to relate to Him. And I'm not interested in relating to Him just because I need something right now and He's the cosmic bellhop who's going to bring my luggage to me if I tip Him. Heaven forbid. He calls me to love Him, to take up my cross, and to follow Him. The Bible even talks about people who are deemed worthy to suffer for the sake of Jesus. Whoa. This is a whole different thing. We're not to believe him for what we get out of it. We believe him because it's true. But the truth of it is still the love story that he's come to rescue us. He is the savior of the world. He is the anointed one of Israel. Why do we love God? Gimme, gimme, gimme. It's, it's, yes, y'all say me happy birthday. Thank you. It is my birthday today. I am 59, which, by the way, is extremely humorous because I had to do this insurance form one time, and the nurse is interviewing me, and she said, how old are you? And I don't know at the time. I'm just going to say 54. 54. And she said, okay, are your mother and father still alive? I said, no, my, my father's passed away. And she said, well, how old was he when he died? And I told her, and what did he die from? And I told her, is your mother still alive? I said, yes, she is. And how old's your mother? And I said, 39. And she's writing it down. She said, she said, what? I said, 39. She said, you're 54. And I said, right. She said, well, your mother can't be 39. And I said, well, you'll have to take that up with her. <laughs> She's told me she's 39, and my, I'm not going to call my mom a liar. She said, well, but you can't, she can't be 39. And this woman evidently didn't have any sense of humor. She said, she can't be 39 if you're 54. And I said, you'll have to take that up with her. And so anyway, um, how did I digress into that? Oh, I remember now. So I'm 59. My wife and my kids and my mom and my sisters and brother-in-laws and, and family and so many of you, my friends, have been so kind to give me well-wishing phone calls and text messages and emails and cards and food and gifts and, and things. And, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart, but that's not why I love you. I don't love you because I get a gift from you on my birthday. We don't love God because He gives us gifts, although we do love because He first loved us. But He's taught us that. He's modeled that. And it stirs up within us a reaction. It's the love of God that, that has sought us out, has pursued us. Why do we follow Jesus? Because He follows us. He pursues us. He knocks on the door of our heart. He's that nagging voice inside you saying, there's got to be more to life. He's that nagging voice inside you that says, i got to be made for more than this. He's that nagging voice inside you that says, 
ah, this isn't right for me to do. He's that nagging voice inside you that says, I don't want to be alone. Is there nobody here to be with me? Jesus is that nagging voice because he's pursuing you. Why do we care about any of this? Because this is who Jesus is. Our motives need to be not, oh, he was an interesting teacher and a freak show. No, he's not. He's a charlatan if he's not the son of God. See, you can compare Jew, Jerusalem and Samaria. Jerusalem, many believed in his name when they saw the signs, but Jesus didn't entrust himself to them. But I want to be like the Samarit Samarians. I want, to, I want to believe that Jesus is Messiah because of his word. I want to believe and know that he is indeed the Savior of the world because I need a Savior. I want him to stay with me and dwell with me and entrust himself to me as I entrust myself to him. I want to move from a fascination with miracles, knowledge, politics, self-success to honoring Jesus for who he is as well as what he does. This is not anything less. Uh, we've got a few folks in here that are in politics. Um, uh, my state rep now, my state rep before that, my state rep before that. All in this class. They love the Lord more than they do their politics. I want that. I want that. I would be scared to death of a politician who was professing faith because it helped their political career. I'd be scared to death of a business person who's professing faith because it helped their business career. I'd be scared to death of a person who's professing faith because of what it does for them. That's not what it's about. I want to honor Jesus for who he is as well as what he does in this world, in my life, and what he will do in the day of, of, of his second coming. That's the lesson to me of this passage. That's the contrast. So where am I? I don't want to be in the plural you. I don't want to be one of the, unless y'all see, oh look, the Lubbock translation. Unless y'all see signs and wonders, y'all will not believe. I don't want to be that. And I don't want to go there. I want to honor Jesus, the Messiah. As he said to the Samaritan woman, I who speak to you am he. I am the Messiah. The anointed one of Israel. The prophesied one who would come. The king of kings who would sit on the throne of David forever. The lion of Judah. The lamb of God. And I want to honor the God who saves. Because he is indeed the Savior of the world. Can I bless you in the name of Jesus? Father, we pray a blessing on you. We as your people bless you. We, we, we bless your name. We bless who you are. With humble adoration and praise on our lips, Father, through the blood of Jesus, we come to you and say thank you for your love. Thank you for your pursuit of our hearts and our minds and our lives. Thank you for your, your direction. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for calling out to our hearts. Father, we entrust ourselves to you. As Savior of the world, we humbly trust you and the cross on which you died to set us right. Would you bless my brothers and sisters and all who hear this message with a divine touch from you that calls them into a deeper, substantial walk based on who you are as well as what you've done. Amen. Thank you, guys. Have a good week.